In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which God had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Happy Sabbath to all those who are listening. Perhaps some parts of the world the Sabbath has already passed. But even though the holy day may have passed where you are, the requirement to holy to be holy never, ever passed. And so Sabbath greetings to you. I'm grateful to God for this great, great honor to speak for him and for the sweet privilege of fellowshipping with his people all over the world at the same time. I'm personally grateful to God for modern technology that allows me to sit in a hotel room in Southern California, which is where I am, because I'm also doing another assignment, sit in this hotel room and speak to you wherever you are. I was greatly delighted to see my precious friends who sang the theme song, Isaac and Mercy. I'm sure there are many others whom I know, but I cannot see your faces. May the Lord bless you. If there's anyone listening who is not a Seventh-day Adventist, I particularly welcome you with great delight. And may the God grant you a sweet, sweet blessing because you've chosen to spend time with us. My desire is to present, thus said the Lord, and I thank you for your prayers that God of heaven and earth will put his words in my mouth because my words have absolutely no power. Before I get into the message, let me ask you to do three little things for me. One, remember that God is a holy God. He always is holy. Whether we worship him in a church or via Zoom, it does not affect the holiness of God. So wherever you are, particularly if you are in your homes where you are relaxed, preserve reverence, monitor your children. We are worshiping God. And in some kind of way, put off our shoes from off our feet, a symbolic way of showing respect for God. If you don't need your phone, turn it off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter one, verse nine. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I really, as God is alive today, my desire is to speak God's words. Prophets and Kings, page 626, paragraph 1 and 2, paragraph 2, the Ellen White writes, the words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God requires you and me to think as we listen. In that activity, the Spirit of God will cooperate and give us light and understanding of God's word. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of life. Despite all the trials and tribulations of modern life and all the restrictions brought about by this pandemic, no one under the sound of my voice desires to die right now. We treasure life and we thank you for it. As we bow in your presence, dear God, if we have offended you, forgive us. Christ died to make it possible for you to forgive and still be a just God. 
I pray that you would accept me there, God, as your servant, your instrument. I humble myself before you, and I ask you, in the name of Jesus Christ, a name you never resist, speak through me, dear God. Put your words in my mouth, your spirit in my heart, dear God, truth in my mind. Bless everyone listening, Father. Help me to make the message so simple that even little boys and little girls will understand the sweet truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those watching, dear God, who are not seven of the Adventists, bless them in a very direct way, Father, to such a degree that they will want to fellowship with us again. If anyone listening to me has contracted COVID-19, I call upon you, dear God, in the name of Jesus, heal that person, Father. Not only if the person is a believer, even if the person is an unbeliever, heal that person because your word says he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Whoever is afflicted by this condition, heal that person, dear God, because you're a merciful God. Bless your people, particularly at the host church, I pray in Stockholm. Let that presence of that church be the reason why many will be ready to meet Christ when he comes. But Father, extend your blessing to all those who are listening from whatever country, where they are. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name, and I hope you will say with me, amen and amen. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2 or chapter 1, and we shall read verse 26. Genesis 1, we shall read verse 26 of Genesis 1, and I read from the King James Version of the Bible. You may have some different version, but I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse 26. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Stop. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. This statement was made on the sixth day of creation, but there were five prior days of creation. Let's examine what God said on those days. Verse three of Genesis one, and God said, let there be light. You look at verse uh, six of Genesis um, one, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Look at verse nine. And God said, let the, waters be, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. You look at verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Look at verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. You look at verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. You look at 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Now, why am I taking you through this? On the first five days of creation, God did not say, let us make anything in our image. Not the light, not the firmament, not the grass, not the sun, moon, and stars, not the fish of the sea or the fowl of the air, not the land animals. He reserved that statement, let us make man in our image, in our image, after our likeness, was reserved only for human beings. Nothing else in creation was made directly in the image of God on that first week of creation. Let me repeat that. Nothing else during the first the week of creation was made directly in the image of God. Now, surely the glory of God is seen in the heavens. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Isaiah 6, verse 3, the whole earth is full of his glory. And so when we examine nature, we see evidence of the goodness, the beauty, the love of God for symmetry and order and design. Yes, we catch glimpses of the kind of God God is. But to look at the, to see the image of God, if you were some visitor from some other part of space on the first week of creation, to see the image of God as fully as it could be seen in a being that was not divine, you would have had to have looked at Adam and Eve. And so God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Our subject for today is a personal God, a personal God. In the creation of Adam, we see the work of a personal God. 
because Adam was made with a desire for companionship. This is the way God is. God desires companionship. That is why he does everything in his power to bring us back to him. Why? Because sin created estrangement, a separation between God and us. Where there's sin, they cannot be that fellowship that God desires. And so Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 say, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and his sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Sin created a barrier. But God desires relationship and fellowship so much because he's a personal God that he sent Christ to reestablish that face-to-face -face relationship with him, which he enjoyed before Adam and Eve fell into sin. A personal God believes and enjoys personal relationships. Let me pray again before I go any further. Father in heaven, continue to instruct me as to what I should say. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. Listen to me carefully. A personal God, enjoys personal relationships. Yes, we know God is the great God of heaven and earth. The Bible says in Psalm 115, verse 16, the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. You know, where God lives in heaven, you read us, Acts chapter 7, 47 to 50, where the Bible says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. If the earth is God's footstool, this is a big God. What house can he build for me? Or what is the place of my rest? God is a big God. But this big God, who is bigger than the universe, he desires to have a relationship with you. I am not talking about the person sitting next to you on the couch or on the chair, wherever you are. He desires a relationship with you. And I'm referring to you, this great God that the heavens cannot accommodate. He wants a one-to-one -one relationship with you. And so God said, let us make man in our image. Adam desired companionship. God said, it is not good that man should be alone, but it is not good that God should be alone. And he misses you. It is not good that God should be alone. You may say, well, there's the Father, there's the Son, the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, yes. They're all divine. But the Holy Spirit doesn't worship the Father. The Son in his divinity does not worship the Father. Worship is an act of love based on obedience. How, where can God enjoy that worship? He gets it from his created beings, from you and from me and from the angels, those on unfallen worlds, the seraphim, the cherubim. That's where he gets his worship. He wants worship from us. Not because he's self-centered and egotistical, but it allows him to fellowship with us in a very intimate and close way. Why? Because God is a personal God. How do we know? How do we understand God? Let us go to John 17. We'll read from verse 1. John 17, reading from verse 1, our subject, a personal God. He is more personal than any God you can find in any other religious system. The Christian God is a personal God who does not like distance from his creation. John 17, reading from verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That verse is one of the most significant verses in the entire Bible. This is life eternal. And what is it you and I desire? Life eternal. Why did Christ die? One of the reasons was to make available to us life eternal. By the way, we must have life eternal now before we have it everlastingly. Let me say that again. When you surrender the life to Christ, you enjoy life eternal now. That quality of life, when he comes, it becomes everlasting. It never ends. One of the reasons Christ came that we might have life eternal John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, 
to kill and to destroy. That's Satan. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Christ said that of living people. He said, I came to give living people life. The life clearly is that eternal life that only comes to those who know God. And so Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. How do we know this personal God? How do we come acquainted with a personal God? Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved you enough, he said enough, he sent Christ to save you. When Adam and Eve sinned, here's what happened. The world was given to Adam and Eve. Let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl of the air. They were given dominion. The earth was placed under the dominion of Adam. Eloise says Adam was crowned king of Eden. When he sinned, separation came between God and his creation. And God gave the world over to Christ. The world could no longer fellowship with God directly. Listen to me carefully. God turned the world, his creation, over to Christ. Because the moment Adam sinned, Christ's blood became effective, even though it had not yet been shed. Let me say that again. Let me pray for his father. Speak to me now as I deal with the delicate subject. In your name I pray. Amen. The instant Adam sinned, the blood of Christ became effective because there's only one way for someone to be saved and that is by the blood of Jesus Christ representing the life of Christ and so even before Christ physically died his blood was effective because his word is that powerful and so Christ's blood became effective and the father gave the world over to Christ Christ in his sacrifice and all that he did, the plan of salvation is a plan God devised so that the world can be given back to the Father. Let me pause so you can understand what I'm saying. I said, God is a personal God. He loves personal relationships. Sin brought about separation. Through Christ, all those who accept Christ as Savior, and Lord, through him, we will be given back to God. That's when we shall see his face. Revelation 22, verse 4. So the plan of salvation is a plan devised by the Father and the Son to restore fallen creation back to the hands of the Father. Right now, you and I can only come to the Father through Jesus Christ. But who wants to talk to his girlfriend or boyfriend through somebody else? Who wants to have this intimacy with spouse through someone else? That's not ideal. It is the way it exists now, but it is not ideal. A personal God wants the situation to be this. There is no mediator. Let me say it again. A personal God will not be fully satisfied until the need for a mediator is removed. There is still that need, and so we come to the Father through Christ. There's someone between us and the Father, and that person is Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But before sin, that was not the case. Adam could speak face to face with God without the need for Jesus Christ standing between the two. One day, when sin has been done away with, its consequences removed. All evidences of sin gone, a new world established, new heavens, we shall regain what we lost. We shall have fellowship with God face to face without a mediator. And I'm telling you, a personal God will not be fully and finally satisfied unless he interacts with us, with you and with me face to face. We serve a God who is still eager and anxious and yearning and longing for that day. Even in our saved condition, it is not ideal. What do I mean by that? Let's go to John 14 as we discuss a personal God. John 14, reading from verse 1. And let me say, I'm trying to see you by faith, wherever you are, Uganda, Kenya, Sweden, Denmark, wherever the United States 
wherever you are, I hope you're still with us. And someone has already said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. John 14, reading from verse 1, read microscopically. Now listen carefully. By the way, when you read the Bible, read it as if the voice of God is speaking to you. It is more than as if it is literally the voice of God. Someone wrote me and said, I need to hear God's voice loudly. My simply said, read the Bible. The words of the Bible are the loud words of God. John 14, reading from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. What is Jesus Christ implying? We're not yet unto himself as he desires. We're not yet unto the Father as he desires. And so he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there he may be also. A personal God wants us with him with nothing intervening right now in Christ. We're God's children. Yes, no argument, no discussion, no controversy. But God still cannot enjoy that fellowship he enjoyed before sin. And he desires it. Why? Because he is a personal God. To understand God completely, well, not completely, but to understand God to a degree that changes our lives, we need to understand Jesus. There is no other way to understand the Father but through Christ. Jesus told Philip, if you go with me to stay in John 14, let's read from verse 8. John 14, verse 8, our subject, a personal God. Philip saith unto him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. What does that mean? Does it mean those who saw the nose of Christ got some idea of what the nose of the Father is like? No. Those who saw Christ in operation they saw a precise reflection of the character and the attitude and the disposition of the Father. Because one of the primary purposes for Christ coming to this world was to reveal to the world who the Father is, was and is. And so Jesus said to Philip, but Philip is dead. And so the words are for you and for me. He that have seen me have seen the Father. Let's take a look. At the Father in operation on the earth. Mark chapter 1, read from verse 40, I believe it is. It says, And they came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. The Bible says, And Jesus moved with compassion put forth his hand and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. He was moved with compassion. Now, Jesus said, he that have seen me have seen the Father. Christ did not mean it physically because God is a spirit. We do not fully understand how God exists. We know he's a personal God because a personal God made personal human beings. A personal God is represented in the person of Jesus Christ. But that does not mean we know exactly what God looks like because God is a spirit. And a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. But whatever God is like, we do know from the Bible, he is a personal God. And Jesus reflected the, the Father perfectly without flaw. Now, if it had been the Father literally who had been on the earth and the leper had come to him, the Father would have been moved with compassion the same way Jesus was moved with compassion. As a matter of fact, he was. He was moved above. Christ was moved on the earth. The relation between the Father and the Son is so close that what moves the Son moves the Father. By the way, the relation between Christ and us is so close. What affects us affects him because as the Father is the personal God, Christ is a personal Savior. In the Desire of Ages, page 823, paragraph 4, Ella White writes, Christ feels the woes of every human sufferer. 
When spirits rend the human frame, he feels the agony. When fever burns up the life current, he feels it. He feels the agony. He feels the curse. She is saying Christ feels the woes of every sufferer. There's someone listening to me with a migraine headache. Jesus feels it. That's how personal he is. But the father feels it as well because the father is just like Jesus and it was the father who sent the son to die for us. Let me say it again. Heaven feels what we feel. There's someone who just lost a loved one. A wife lost her husband. A mother just buried a child. Jesus feels that loss. The father feels that loss. Why? Because they're personal gods. The Desire of Ages 823 paragraph 4. Christ feels the wars of every sufferer. When spirits rend the human frame, he feels the curse. Mm -hmm. When fever is burning up the life current, he feels the agony. I say again, what you feel as a child of God, Jesus feels because he has that connection through his humanity. When Paul was persecuting the church, in Acts chapter nine, also in 22 and 26, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts 9 verse 4. Why are you persecuting me? What does Jesus tell the sheep? Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Jesus Christ, who represents the Father, feels the suffering that you are going through right now. The Father feels it through Jesus Christ, because Christ is the one through whom we interact with the Father. And I'm saying to you, the Father yearns for the day when there will be no mediator, and you and he can fellowship face to face. We serve a personal God. He doesn't like suffering. And so when the leper said, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, by speaking to Jesus, he was speaking to the Father. But there's something else you and I need to understand that emphasizes the personality, the, the personal nature of the Father and his love for you. It was the Father that told Jesus to heal that leper. Because Jesus said, the words I speak, I speak not of myself. Every word Jesus spoke, the Father told him to speak. Everything he did, the Father told him to do. When we read the miracles of Christ, his healings, Whatever he did that blessed humanity, we tend to see only Christ. So we forget that Christ was an agent of the Father. An agent does not work for himself. An agent works for someone else. Jesus Christ is the Father's agent in salvation as verily as Christ was the Father's agent in creation. And so when Jesus says, I will be thou clean, he was saying what the Father told him to say. I am not saying that had the father not said that, Christ would not have healed the man. The father and the son have the same character. But Christ in his humanity was led by the father. Every person Christ healed, he healed at the direction of the father. Because Jesus says, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of the father which have sent me, John 6, 38. It was the will of the father that that leper be cleansed when Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus, John eleven forty three, He said, Lazarus, come forth. The father told him to do that. Because he does not like death. He does not like sickness. He does not like suffering. When Jesus healed the man with a withered arm, you can have a withered arm and still be in good health. But a withered arm was not the way God made Adam. And so a withered arm hurts the heart of God because it represents imperfection in creation. It represents the workings of sin. When someone is born blind, it breaks the heart of the father. It's not his fault. It's the result of sin. And so the father is touched by our suffering. And every miracle Jesus performed, the father told him to perform it. Every word of comfort Jesus uttered, the father told him to utter it. Why? Because God is so personal. He's affected by our sufferings. He's also affected by our joys and our rejoicing. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. God desires a personal relationship with you. It is of little value to you to see God as simply sitting somewhere in heaven and just gazing down upon the activities of humanity. 
this may be a reality, it brings little comfort to you. You need to understand that the God that the heavens cannot accommodate wants to sit right next to you. Yeah, more than that, he wants to occupy your heart so that from a position in your heart, he can direct your life and enjoy that intimate relationship that he desires so much. In the parable of the lost sheep, Luke 15, from verse three onward, what man of you having a hundred sheep? Well, let me pray before I go on. Father, as I continue, help me to make it truly simple and by your spirit, make it powerful. And clear, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, just one? We have no idea how many worlds are in the universe. Astronomers estimate there are between 100 billion and 400 billion stars only in the Milky Way, which is our galaxy. They've also told us there are billions of galaxies. I read sometime that astronomers estimate the number of stars in the entire universe is one billion trillion. I cannot wrap my head around that. Now, those are the stars they estimate in the observable universe. There are parts of the universe that no um, telescope can penetrate. Now, the Bible gives us hints. There are occupied worlds in the universe. The only one where sin occurred is this one called earth. I'm talking about the personal nature of God. Now, God could have said, look, that's just one earth. Destroy it. Make it again. Mm -mm. God made Adam and Eve and desired a relationship with them. Instead of blotting them out and starting all over, he made a plan to restore them to the original sinlessness. Why? Because God is so personal that when one world fell, he acted. It affected him. Matthew 9 Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. What does that mean? It is similar to the parable of the lost sheep. And I'll get back to the lost sheep. The sparrow back then was the most common cheap bird, two for a farthing. A farthing is no longer used in the British system. They discontinued that, I believe, in 1961. But it, it was virtually useless. It, it was worth very little. Jesus is saying, the great God of heaven and earth, who is bigger than the universe, he sees and he cares when one little bird drops dead. Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 85, paragraph 4, he who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, at the same time cares for the wants of the little brown sparrow, that sings its humble song without fear. What a beautiful statement. Listen again. Steps to Christ, page 85, paragraph 4. He who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, at the same time cares for the wants of the little brown sparrow that sings its humble song without fear. That quotation ends this way. No tears are shed that God does not know this. There is no smile that he does not mark. But let me give you a little more of that quotation. It is so beautiful as it highlights the personal nature of God. He who upholds the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, at the same time cares for the wants of the little brown sparrow that sings its humble song without fear. When men go forth to their daily toil, as when they engage in prayer, when they lie down at night, and when they rise in the morning, when the rich man feasts in his palace, or when the poor man gathers his children about the scanty board, all are tenderly watched by the Heavenly Father. No tears are shed that God does not notice. Someone listening to me has cried because COVID-19 took a family member, or COVID-19 took your job and you're panicking. Someone listening to me has cried. The servant of the Lord writes, no tears are shed that God does not notice. There is no smile that he does not mark. Your child graduated from medical school, law school or high school, and there was celebration and God saw it and he smiled with you. You're at a funeral for a loved one and God sees it and he cries with you. Because we serve a personal God. Now we go back to the lost sheep in Luke 15 from three. What man of you? Having a hundred sheep, 
if you lose one of them, just one out of 100, doth not leave the 90 and 9 in the wilderness and go after that which was lost until he find it, which means when one lost soul comes to God through Christ, there is more rejoicing in heaven than over the 99 righteous people who are already in heaven. Someone listening to me is a lost sheep. You've left Christ. You were faithful. You led out in church. You studied the Bible. You conducted Bible studies. You were the choir lead. You left him, not lost him. A lot of people think they lost. You don't lose God. We leave God. You have left him. He's been searching for you. He has left the 99. The others in the church, he's come looking for you. When he findeth it, he layeth it on his shoulder. What is the shoulder? It symbolizes the place where God carries our burdens. He puts that lost sheep on his shoulder. But observe, when he finds the lost sheep, it is just to save the shepherd and the sheep. There's no one else around. Why? Because a personal God does not need a third party involved. You and God. But now there's a third party in Jesus Christ who is just like the Father. And as I said earlier, the day is coming when you and I and Christ and the Father will fellowship without the intervening presence of a third party. God is a personal God. And God cares about your burden you are carrying now. I don't know what the burden is. But I know you have a burden. There's no such thing as living in this world without burdens. Whether you're a millionaire or a pauper, we all carry burdens. God has come to you to say, let me help you carry that burden. I care about you. Let me say something that sounds drastic. Listen carefully. Forget the person next to you. God cares about you as if no one else on earth is alive. Mm -hmm. You. He cares about you. Steps to Christ, page 100, paragraph 1. The relations between Christ and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul on earth to share his watch care, not another soul for which he gave his beloved son. The relations between God, I should say, and each soul. What is the, uh, the author saying? God deals with you. When you pray to God, he listens as if no one else in the universe is praying at that time. Why? Because he's a personal God. When you're suffering, God looks at your suffering as if no one else is suffering. Because God does not, even though God cares for the whole world, and he does, and being God, he's able to interact with everyone at the same time, but the attention he gives to you is so intense that it's as if no one else is calling upon him. No one else has any need for his services. This is the picture of the sheep and the shepherd in the wilderness. The shepherd leaves the mighty and nine. He finds that lost sheep. And when he finds the sheep, it is just the sheep and the shepherd. And by the way, when the shepherd went looking for that sheep, the shepherd faced disaster. He faced hardship because in those days, there were lions, there were the bears, there were wolves, there were dangerous animals. Remember, Samson killed a lion, David killed a lion, killed a bear. They no longer exist in that part of the world. They've been made extinct, hunted to extinction in that part of the world. But back then, they were wild animals. And the shepherd went alone, braving all the dangers to reach that lost sheep. My listening friend, I want you to walk away from this presentation understanding the God of heaven and earth cares about you personally and wants a relationship with you personally. I want you to understand that the God of heaven and earth has been dreaming from the day you left him and drifted off into the world, not unconsciously, by your own actions, your own active neglect, if those two words can go together. I want you to know that the God of heaven and earth is concerned that you are a widow with three children and you're struggling and he wants to help. I want you to understand, dear student, that the God of heaven and earth is interested in the fact that you need tuition. I want you to understand, oh sick member, that the God of heaven and earth is a God that brings healing 
He forgiveth all our iniquities. He heals our diseases. Psalm 103, verse 3. This is the God I present to you, a personal God. Very often, we read the Bible, we see God as harsh and bloodthirst in the Old Testament. We see Christ as sweet in the New. He is sweet. He's not bloodthirsty, nor is the Father. Let me tell you something. The sweetness of Christ in the New Testament is the sweetness of the Father. Because everything he did, the Father told him to do. Everything he said, the Father told him to say. And so today, I offer to you a personal God. You may be a guest listening to me. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Here is what a personal God is telling you. If you will surrender to the conviction to begin observing the Seventh-day Sabbath, a personal God gives you this guarantee. I will give you the power. I will make the way for you to obey. That's the promise of a personal God. If you will decide not to work on Sabbath, a personal God gives you his guarantee. He will provide for you if you make up your mind to obey God. But disobedience deprives a personal God of the opportunity to express his personal love. But where there's trust in this one-to-one -one God, we see demonstrations of his power. You and I, we serve, whether we know it or not, a personal God. And to understand this personal God, we need to study the life of the personal savior, whose mission was, among other things, to represent to the world what a loving and personal God the Father is. Will you not, right where you sit, make a decision? Several decisions are possible, depending on your condition. One, if you've already been walking with God, rededicate your life to him. This ought to be done daily. Because every night we sleep, we're dead. Sleep is death. You rise in the morning, it's in your lifetime. So we have 24-hour lifetimes. Recommit your life to God every day and do it 100%. If you've left God, come back. The way back you know, come back. You can come back without moving your feet. You come back right here by re-surrendering your life to him, confessing your sin, apologizing for rejecting the God of love. He will take you back. He does not put you on probation. He will take you back. You don't have to prove how good you are. He takes you back. Make that decision. To serve God. Come back to him. Make a decision to start observing the Sabbath. Of the Ten Commandments, the one that is a challenge for most people is the fourth, which happens to be the most important commandment of the Ten, for in that commandment we have the title of God, we have what makes him God, we have the area of his supremacy, which is the universe. The commandment that identifies God as creator is the one the devil has successfully attacked with human cooperation and almost blotted it out from the consciousness of most of the world. I call upon you in the name of Jesus, make a decision. Don't wait to figure out how, just make the decision. I want to keep God's seven days Sabbath. You used to, you stop, come back. And so I've made several appeals, I'll make another one. You've drifted so far from God, you need to make a decision to be rebaptized. Make it right where you are. You've drifted so far from God, you need to make a decision to be rebaptized. When David committed his terrible sin, Elamite tells us he repented, he was reconverted. There was no baptism then, but had there been baptism, he would have been rebaptized. He was reconverted. And if any time during this series, don't wait for the entire series, if one message in the series touches you, act. Act right now. Make a decision to be rebaptized. Start all over with God. For those of you who've never been baptized, but you've been walking with God, you've grown up in the church, you've come to the church, you need to make a decision. Make it. Make that decision to be baptized. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a personal God. You love one-to-one -one relationships. We thank you for Christ, who's the mediator, but this is not ideal in the sense we cannot come to you directly. 
which was the way you arranged it before sin, and you want that restored. And so, Father, we thank you for being so personal. We thank you that despite the fact you sustain the entire universe, you care about us as individuals. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear God, reach that person who has drifted from you and needs to come back. There's someone listening to me now, and the person is saying, that preacher is speaking to me. Reach that person, Father. Bring the person back. Someone needs to be rebaptized. Move upon the person with the force of love to make that decision. Someone needs to be baptized for the first time. Some young man, some young lady, let that person make the intelligent decision, dear God. Someone is working on Sabbath and needs to stop in obedience and trust you to take care of him or her. Someone is taking classes on Sabbath. That person needs to stop. Help the person to believe that the personal God will see him or her through. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. It is an undying love. It's a love that does not tolerate sin, but does everything to reclaim the sinner. May God take the words I spoke, clarify them anew. Apply them with the force of love to the heart of everyone who listened to God. That no one under the sound of my voice will be lost. Let your people, your children, make a commitment right now to be present for tomorrow's presentation by your grace and your will. Hear this humble prayer, Father, and give me the right message for your beloved people tomorrow. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor Skeet, for the wonderful sermon, The Personal Nature of God. As you have said that some of us will need to be rebaptized, some of us will need to be reconverted, Pastor Skeet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From, from the way you have preached, I would be one of those, and I know oh. the same. Thank you mm. so much. Someone, I wanted to address the question about rebaptism. It's so critical. I don't want to wait until a few days from now. Now is the opportunity. Yes, rebaptism is biblical. Read Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7, where Paul rebaptized 12 disciples. Let me stress, they were disciples, but they knew nothing about the Holy Ghost. When they learned about the Holy Ghost, they were rebaptized. This tells us people who, who are missing vital information regarding salvation, when they receive it, they should consider rebaptism. You may love God, but you never knew about the Sabbath. You never knew about the second coming. You never knew about the Holy Spirit. When you've learned these things, you need to make a decision to be rebaptized. You're not rebaptized each time you eat a pork chop. I'm not saying that. But if you've drifted far from God, you come back through baptism. You've committed the sin that embarrassed the church. You need to come back through baptism. So, yes, rebaptism is absolutely biblical. Read Acts 19, verses 1 to 7, where the Apostle Paul met 12 disciples i repeat and they were rebaptized so if the person asking the question is considering rebaptism you are considering something that is 100 biblical god bless you